Welcome back to Quantitative Analysis and Anthropology. I'm Professor Peregrine, and today we're on Topic 6, Lesson 1. The topic is Null Hypothesis Significance Testing. We're going to talk about theories and hypotheses, starting off with hypotheses, obviously, because that's going to be a core piece of Null Hypothesis Significance Testing. I want to make a strong point right now at the beginning, and I will be reinforcing this through this topic, and that is, this is a really difficult topic. It seems very simple, but null hypothesis significance testing is one of the most difficult things for students to come to understand. And it's because a lot of the logic is backwards. What we're trying to do in null hypothesis significance testing is to disprove the null hypotheses, and we do that by finding phenomena that are of very, very low probability, and somehow that difference, disproving with low probability, uh, seems confusing. So I'm going to try to go over this relatively thoroughly and slowly so that you can understand it, and, and I encourage you to spend some time on uh, the text and maybe going through these lessons again until you're absolutely sure you understand null hypothesis significance testing. But we're going to begin talking about theories and hypotheses. So what is a theory? The simple answer is that it is a coherent explanation of some kind of phenomenon. That's all. It's a coherent explanation of some kind of phenomenon. We get up in the morning, we get out of bed, we assume that the world is still there, that there's still an outside there. And when we go to the outside, we see it's there. Our theory, sort of the, the world is persistent. We need an explanation of that phenomenon, and that explanation comes down basically to basic physics and how everything works. In a sense, our hypothesis is when we get up in the morning, the world is there. The underlying theory is because the laws of physics keep it there, all right? Theories rely on natural processes, and I put that in uh, emphasis because you will come across, even in good science, sometimes theories that are based on what we might call supernatural or preternatural processes, ones that we don't fully understand. One of those right now is, in physics, string theory, which one could call preternatural, where there isn't any real natural understanding of how it would work, but it is thought that it would be a natural process once it's understood. Supernatural processes involve gods and spirits and magic and things that are identified as being above the natural world. They are supernatural. They're things that are not expected to be natural. Those are not scientific theories. We cannot argue scientifically that a miracle occurred, um, that some explanation of a phenomenon is because uh, gods are causing it or because demons are causing it. That's not a natural process a natural explanation. Theories are evidence-based, and in part, the reason that we look at natural processes is because we can get uh, empirical observable evidence of them. It's one of the problems with string theory, why it's called pressure natural, because there isn't good evidence for it other than mathematics. There's not physical tangible evidence for it. Um, supernatural processes, by definition, don't have evidence. So that's why they can't, or one of the reasons they can't be a theory. We can't have an explanation of a phenomenon that says God did it, because there's no tangible empirical evidence for that. Finally, and this is a difficult concept, and I'm going to try to uh, emphasize this as we go through null hypothesis significance testing. A theory, to be a scientific theory, has to have warrant, meaning that it has to be warranted. Okay. 
Having warrant means that it is coherent, not only internally, but with everything else we know about the world, that the evidence for it is supportive, and that that evidence fits with the other evidence that has already been gathered about the world. Um, warrant is a complex subject, and we're going to need to spend some time talking about it, but basically an idea or a theory is warranted if it coheres with all other evidence and knowledge that we have. Let me give you an example. Among some people, there is an idea that uh, radiocarbon dating in archaeology is just wrong and that the Earth is very, very young, in fact, that it was uh, created by God in 4004 BC. We don't need to go where that comes from, but it comes out of the Bible. Okay, Bible is the evidence. We can argue whether that's reasonable evidence or not. There is a coherent explanation of the phenomenon, and that is that the Bible tells us what happened by looking at who begot whom. But that theory has no warrant, because if it is right, we have to throw out what we know about atomic physics, which means we have to throw out all of chemistry and essentially all of our understanding of how the processes of chemical and biological phenomenon happen, and that's not warranted. There's no warrant for throwing out all this other stuff that's coherent and has evidence, especially when we have good evidence that the Earth is older than 6,000 years. All right, that's theory. What is a hypothesis? Because we're going to be testing hypotheses in null hypothesis significance testing. So what is an hypothesis? All right, a hypothesis is a prediction based on a theory. A theory says something, some process is going on, you build a hypothesis saying, if that's true, then I should see this. So, if we think about getting up out of bed, if the universe is stable, my prediction would be when I get out of bed in the morning, things are the same. If the universe was unstable, get up in the morning and the world would be totally different. So a hypothesis is, based on the theory that the world is stable, that when I, my prediction is when I get up in the morning, the world is still pretty much the way it was. So here's an example from anthropology. Theory. Language shapes perception. This is the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, those of you who are doing linguistics. Language shapes perception. That's a theory. It has warrant. It has evidence. It's an established theory, if not a controversial and, and often discussed theory, but it is an established theory in linguistics. And here might be a hypothesis based on it. That individuals are better able to distinguish colors in languages with more color terms. That flows right out of the theory, right? And what you can see is that the hypothesis is a prediction based on that theory. If language shapes perception, then Languages with more color terms should provide the opportunity to, for people to see more differences in color. And actually, that hypothesis has been tested in a variety of ways and seems to, be, to have some support to it, which is very interesting. All right. In no hypothesis significance testing, what we are trying to do is establish scientific evidence. But when we say proof, we're putting it in the wrong way because scientific theories and hypotheses cannot be proven. If you use the word proven in a paper, your professor should strike it out and say, no, 
It's been demonstrated. It has been argued. It has been hypothesized. Scientific ideas are never proven. They can only be disproven. There's a, a complex philosophy of science behind that. We talked uh, about it a little bit earlier uh, on how we think we know things, but um, the, the logic of this comes from what's called logical positivism. We don't need to get into that. And particularly a philosopher called Karl Popper. Um, but this is sort of the basic idea of what science is all about. You pose a hypothesis based on a theory, and then you test it to try to disprove it, to try to disprove it. If you don't disprove it, then that provides support. And that support, if a theory is tested again and again and again and again, ends up making a scientific theory so well supported and so coherent, so warranted among other bodies of knowledge that scientists assume that it's true. But there's nothing true. Theories are never supported. They become more and more and more and more likely based on rigorous testing. And finally to the point that we can say, yeah, we, we can assume that that's true. But you know what? It can be disproven eventually. Even the most thought to be true scientific idea can be ultimately disproven, and in the history of science has been many times. Scientific truth. Obviously there is none. Given that, there is none. Sorry to break the news to you, but there is no absolute truth. What there is, is better and better approximations of truth to the point that we can be very, very, very certain this is true. And we have some ideas that are very certain to be true, like the theory of gravity, uh, the theory of atomic structure, the theory of evolution. Those have been so rigorously tested time and time and time again that we can assume them to basically be true. That doesn't mean that they're going to, not going to be refined in lots of ways and that they're not going to change over time in terms of the details. But in general, those theories can be thought to be true. But it's true in quotation marks. The really interesting thing about science, and that's really important about statistics, is that with statistics, we can make probabilistic estimates about how true something might be. That is, we can say, we have confidence in this at probability of 75% or of 0.75. We're 75% confident that this is true, but we are never going to get to 100%. Theory of gravity theory of evolution, we're at 99.99%. We'll never get to 100% on any scientific theory. That makes people uncomfortable, but it is one of the things that is most misunderstood about science, that science establishes truth. Science establishes very, 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 very likely things, but never proof. So scientific knowledge is something that is changing. Scientific knowledge is based on evidence. And evidence is always being accumulated. So, scientific knowledge is changing. Why? Because knowledge grows, think about this, by elimination. We have a theory, we create an hypothesis, we test that hypothesis and we disprove it or we support it. That's null hypothesis significance testing. As we find more and more hypotheses that are supported and more and more that are disproven, we come to better and better approximations of truth, of what the real phenomenon is out there. 
But think about this. Evidence, as you're testing these theories, is being accumulated. Knowledge grows by eliminating those ideas that don't have support. That seems kind of contrasting, and it is, so that knowledge has to be seen not as a thing, not as a truth, but as a process. Knowledge is an ongoing process. It is not a thing. Knowledge is a process through which we come to better and better approximations of truth by accumulating evidence that leads to the elimination of unwarranted ideas. Warrant are those that have evidence supporting them and are coherent with other bodies of knowledge. That's what scientific knowledge is. All right, if we want to be scientists then, the attitude we have to follow is something like this. We have to accept that evidence is the basis of knowledge. And this is what sometimes is called the Cartesian assumption based on a French philosopher, René Descartes, whose famous phrase is, I think, therefore I am. Uh, that comes down to the idea that I can know the world through my own perception. And what that means is that I can get tangible evidence through my senses, and from that evidence, I can gain knowledge of how the world really works. Now, you might say, well, that seems just self-evident. That's obvious. It wasn't obvious to people before the 15th, 16th centuries. It became obvious to almost everyone by the 17th century. So not that long ago, what was truth what was knowledge was given by God, or given by the king, or given by the church, or given by the elders, or given by some other uh, thing, in, and not based necessarily on the empirical experience. I think nobody is totally against the empirical experience. Everybody uses the, exper ex the empirical experience to live, but in terms of what's really going on, what knowledge really is, what scientific truth is, it's only after the 17th century that we say empirical evidence. The evidence of our senses provides knowledge. That's a scientific attitude, one part of it. Another part is that because evidence changes and grows and is eliminated and developed, accumulated, we have to be willing to change our ideas based on the evidence. This is one of the things that's often challenged in, uh, by people who are anti-science, um, is that, well, last year you said this, and now you're saying this. Yeah, that's what happens. We've changed our ideas because we have new evidence. Somehow that's seen as being a flaw in science. It's not. It is the basis of science. We change as we gather more evidence. There is no truth. Science grows as we accumulate evidence and test our hypotheses. Since there is new evidence all the time, and since we are testing hypotheses all the time, scientific knowledge changes all the time, and that's okay. We're trying to, be, to come to better and better approximations of what is true. We will never have complete confidence in something, but we can become very, very certain of something. And when we think probabilistically about that, we can say, I'm 90% certain this is what's going on. So as we make decisions, let's talk about climate change. Scientific evidence gives us 95, 98% something certainty that the climate is changing dramatically. Now, if we want to, we can take that five, four, whatever percent and say, I want to believe that. But doesn't it make sense to believe the 95, 98% chance? The other one might be right. There is no climate change going on. This is some weird period of time we're in, and it's going to all reverse. That might be true. 
But the scientific evidence probabilistically argues that what's going on is climate is changing. We're going to continue to rigorously test that. And those ideas are constantly being tested and refined and changed. And understandings are going to change. Someone's going to say, well, you, last year you said that climate uh, was going to change by a degree or two by 2100. Now you're saying it's 2050. What happened? You don't know anything. Your knowledge is changing all the time. No. Knowledge does change all the time, and that's okay. That's what we expect. That's how science proceeds. All right. That's my shtick on science, but I hope out of that you come to understand what a theory is, a coherent explanation of a phenomenon, and out of those grow hypotheses, which are predictions based on that theory. And in null hypothesis significance testing, what we do is test those hypotheses to see if they have warrant, if they can hold up to the evidence. All right. We're going to move on and talk some more about null hypothesis significance testing in the next lesson. See you then.